everybody. Will you stand and worship with us this morning? Good morning. You guys can have a seat. We just have a few announcements 
to go over with you. The first one is we got the baby bottle campaign, and you probably saw those bottles on the counter. So if you didn't get one of those yet, pick one of those up on your way out. And then we have the Chosen series. I don't know. I'm standing in this. Sorry, Miss Terry. The Chosen Bible Study is meeting on <laughs> Wednesdays at 6 p.m., and this has been just a thriving um, yeah. study. So if you have not um, come check that out, you're not too late. And then probably my most excited announcement, um, Power Sports Camp. We've been telling you guys that um, to register the kiddos well, we've been doing this for three years now. And as of this morning when I checked, we have 101 kids already Woo. registered. So keep registering those kids, but we need you. We need yeah. volunteers. And so if you are interested in volunteering, see one of us so we can get your name on a list. <laughs> yeah, we really, really, really need you. Um, can, can I just say that again? Like, we really, really, really need you. Um, this is what's really exciting. Our goal for three years um, has been to see this camp at 100 children. And this year, that is um, being realized, and we're excited. Here's the problem. Uh, it's a great problem. Sometimes problems are good, sometimes they're bad, right? Um, we have a couple weeks left. So the number is not going to stop at 101. Uh, it's going to be more. So if you are all available, we can use your help. And I tell you, we need help in all sorts of ways. Everybody, um, everybody can find a meaningful. You may not like sports. It doesn't matter. These kids aren't good at sports. This is about loving on children for, um, for a couple hours for four days. And that's our real purpose is to love on them. So number one, we really could utilize your um, support in a tangible way. All right, let's, I have, a, I have one, more, um, one more important announcement that I want to share with you. Um, I have it written down here so that I don't, um, I don't butcher it. Um, I need to update you on a new development in our staffing. Uh, last Monday morning, Julie submitted her letter of resignation to me. Um, and that will be effective June the 30th, 2024, so about a month from now. Um, this decision was hers alone. Um, she made it for the primary, of reason, uh, primary reason in kind of a phase of transition to move closer to her son and grandchildren in Iowa. And I know some of you, you can understand that. You, you um, want to be closer to your children and grandchildren, and that's really important. And so um, this is the primary motivation behind um, Julie's decision, and we fully support that. Um, my heart is broken, I'll be honest with you, because Julie has been amazing in the position of executive administrator for the last three years. She's made my life better, um, and I'm going to miss her deeply, but she fully has my support because I believe that this is a God longing in her life. And I'll say this, as a person who without the support of a grandparent being right here, I don't know how, I don't know how people do it, right? And some of you are grandparents. I look around and say, your kids know this. Without you, um, it's really challenging. So um, with that being said, we are completely in support. And here's the most um, important piece. On June the 23rd, we are going to have a day to commission and send Julie off. And one of the best ways you can do that are cards, notes. Uh, she's got a long several day trip up, gift cards to say stop and get a cup of coffee or a um, McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts or something. Um, so, okay, so the 23rd, a couple weeks away, we'll let you know more about that next week, what that's gonna look like. As you can imagine, we've only had six days to process this. That means there's a lot we don't know. Um, the personnel committee and I are beginning the process of assessing our needs stepping forward. Um, so I can't give you kind of any update of what happens next. What we know now is we want to recognize what God has done in this particular time and honor that. All right, would you stand up with me? One last thing before, um, before we move back into worship through music. Um, I don't know, Terry, can you put up our reading for today? Um, we are going to be in 2 Peter, and this is going to be a way of us kind of refocusing our minds together. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we are going to—oh, man, I'm really not where I'm supposed to be. 
in my Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, starting at verse number 9. It says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sexual desires, or excuse me, sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. No 
Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name powerful name it is and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of so thankful for what you're doing in the life of South Lake Wales Church. God, God, we lift up the 101 kids who are already registered for sports. God, I pray that you would begin to work in their lives right now. God, that you would just use this people, this building, this church to further your kingdom. So God, challenge us today, motivate us today to go out and to be the church that you've called us to be. God, 
we thank you for this sweet time of worship tonight. I ask all these things in your name. So uh, I don't normally stand up here, but I'm kind of scared of the projector. So we came in this morning, and our normal wonderful projector that does its job wasn't doing its job, and so this is plan B. Um, but plan B both stole my table and, um, and is like projecting from right there. So I don't want to do shadow puppets, so I'm going to try to go from here. Um, hey, would you open? Would you open your Bible? up to 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, as I've said, as we've been going through this, I really want us to, like, look at this together, mark this up. We're friends. Uh, I love how Peter starts off this, um, the 12th verse, or excuse me, the 11th verse. Uh, Dear friends, uh, and I think this is a turning point in, in this letter. Um, so far, the letter is to remind us what we believe. Um, So far, the letter is to remind us that, listen, we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. That there is now, because, in in Paul's words, because of Christ Jesus, there's nothing that separates us from God. All of those things that once stood in the way, Jesus has removed them, if you'll believe. And listen, um, he says this, "You, you can't do this on your own. You are going to need the infilling work of Holy Spirit. Uh, By the way, today is Pentecost Sunday. Um, Some of you come from backgrounds where Pentecost Sunday is celebrated. Some come from a background and you're saying, what is that? Um, uh, just, Just give you the basics here. 50 days from the day that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. Another Jewish celebration was held called Pentecost. It was a celebration of harvest. And coincidentally, Jesus had told his disciples to go to this place in Jerusalem and wait and to pray. And he promised the Holy Spirit is going to fill you, fall on you. You're going to have an experience. And so as they waited on this day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down on them, and, and this, is, this is what the writer Luke has to say, like, like, a, uh, like tongues of fire, it just, it rested on them. There is an evident thing happening, and it empowered them to do things that humans can't do on their own. It took these, these common, ordinary fishermen and tax collectors and, and, and common workers and, and, and religious zealots, uh, legal zealots, it put in them this new heart so that they were able to do things that on their own ability they couldn't do. And guess what? There was a harvest. As we're celebrating this harvest, let's realize that there is a spiritual harvest today and thousands of people believed in Jesus. Um, it's Peter, It says, Peter stood up, the guy who wrote this letter, the one who's saying to you today, dear friends, he stood up and he said, "Um, okay, because of what Jesus has done, you need to repent and be baptized. Uh, So repent is a, a, man, it's a religiously loaded term, isn't it? It just simply means to know where you are, to know your location, To know the spot in your life that is not submitted to Holy Spirit's direction. Uh, This is a spot I'm I'm choosing my own way. I'm going my own way. And, And this is what Peter really says in this first sermon he preaches after the resurrection of Jesus. On this day we now call Pentecost, he said, listen, you know that you're the ones who crucified Jesus. And I, I say, Um, to you, and you may not know this, Scripture teaches that the wages of our sin have been placed on Jesus, and because of us, Jesus accepted all of the wrath, all of the death that we deserve, all, all of the punishment of God on himself. That's the gospel. And Peter said, now here's what you need to do. Believe that and change your location. Move to Jesus. 
So here's what I know. You have a location today. Every one of you are coming from, quite frankly, a different location. That may be an emotional location. We obviously live, most of us, at different address addresses. But we come from different locations in life. Some in here are at different stages in life. Some are in different occupational levels. Some ha are in the startup phase. Some are in the dreaming phase. Some are in the, um, I, I hope that it all stays together phase. Some are in the, I don't know if I can stay in this location phase. There's all sorts of locations going on. And here's what Peter says to all of us, dear friends. Despite your location, no matter if you're suffering or you're experiencing a, a, a wonderful moment, you are God's chosen people. You. You are chosen. You are living stones. You are a holy nation. You are priests. All of you are being reformed to represent God. Uh, you are witnesses because of what God is changing inside of you uh, <clears throat> changes are an awesome thing aren't they um, all of you have had this experience at some time or another or you've walked up to somebody um, you you have been observing and it seems like somebody is going through a radical transformation in life um, some people you see and they have dramatic weight loss this is one of those universal things in our culture right when somebody loses weight we all begin to assume that is a good thing Sometimes it's not. But the bottom line is this, is when we see a physical transformation, we often want to ask a question. What are you doing? Uh, some of you, you're like, oh, swimsuit season's coming, and I, I want to look good for summer. Others of us are way beyond that. Um, we, we really don't care, right? Um, but, but the bottom line is you see somebody having transformation and your location changes you get close and you ask the question so what are you doing are you taking supplements are you changing you know carbs if you decided to go off carbs i don't know about you i love me some carbs um i i mean whew, uh <clears throat> carbs are wonderful uh, i'm reminded that jesus said you cannot live on bread alone um I don't think he meant it the way I'm applying it right now. Uh, but, but the bottom line is this, is when we see somebody go for a trans, through a transformation, we want to know how. But there's probably a better question. Why? Why are you going through a transformation? Because, um, boy, I tell you, young people, I speak to you, there's a moment you will probably move beyond vanity. And you will start saying, there's a reason I want to lose weight. I went to the doctor, and the doctor said some of these physical ailments um, would be better if you just shed a few pounds. I'll never forget several years ago, I, I have a notoriously bad back. I'm, I'm just a moron. I've done all sorts of things in my life that you shouldn't do using your back. And um, I was in one of those phases where I'm just stuck. You know, you can't stand up straight, and you're, you're that human being. And I went to the doctor to say, can you help me? And um, so we're going through some different things. And um, in my follow-up appointment, he said, you know one of the things that will really help you? If you lose about 15 pounds, you probably would experience some less back pain. I didn't like that doctor very much at that moment. But he gave a very true and practical statement. Transformation comes in all sorts of ways. You may look better, but this is not just about looking good. It's just not about an external transformation. It's about function. It's not just form. Ooh, you look good. It's about function. I'm doing what my body's supposed to do. And this is where we pick up today. Last week I said this, we're all being formed by something. You are all being formed by the culture around us. You are being formed by something in your life. And the most important thing that Jesus brings forward is you've got to recognize what's forming you. Uh, Peter says this. He says, you are being formed. Uh, Second Peter, or excuse me, First Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says that, 
11. Can you put 11 up for me? Um, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul. Uh, Verse 12. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that so that When they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. These verses remind me of form and function. Um, You know, it, it is a call that it's not just about how you look on the outside, but it's so that when people really look at you, they see your function. Now, I'm going to pause right here. Sometimes we need a visual reminder. Uh, Peter says this in the verses right before this, you are living stones. And in his mind, I think he has a picture of a stone mason taking all of these individual stones that have been dumped out and that are being formed and built into something. He knew these people would understand this metaphor, but I don't think most of us aren't, you know, stonemasons. We don't live in a culture. I mean, we live in the world of prefab. If I want stones today, I can go to Lowe's or Home Depot or some other store, and I can buy stones that are pre-shaped, stamped, or, or poured into a form, and now I just go home and, and stack them. It takes all the work out of it, but a real stonemason, he is an artist. A real stonemason looks at what needs to be made and shapes stones to look and function. Um, Take a look at this video. I hope that it will work. So I want you to note the beauty of of this, the artistry of this. All of these stones have a specific shape, a specific purpose. And the artist, the stone worker, takes a chisel to it, shapes it, forms it, takes anything away from it that will keep it from serving its ultimate purpose its function here's here's what i want to do i i want to tell you uh, i want to start here with what is the most important thing can you put up that next slide for me terry the function of your life and of this church is to glorify god verse 12 reminds us of this that you're going to go through a lot of hard times you're going to go through some things But you need to know that despite being, feeling like an alien, feeling like you don't fit, feeling like a stranger, feeling like life shouldn't be this hard, feeling like this relationship shouldn't be like this, feeling like these emotions should feel better. If God were really there, it would be. No, it's understanding that in all of this stuff, God has a function for your life as a follower of Jesus And that is, number one, to bring glory to God. That your life, that your, the the function of your life, whether you are a teacher or a a, a stonemason or a homemaker or a self-employed person, bottom line is God has shaped you into these things you do to glorify Him. No matter your location, No matter your vocation, your number one objective is to bring glory to God. Now, um, I'm going to veer for a moment and say this. We cannot do that on our own. Um, I've spent a good deal of my life now longing to glorify God. Like, I, I think most of us, probably in this room, have had a turning point moment in life where we said we made the statement you know what i really want to glorify god with my life i want people to look at me and to say something's different about you did you lose weight 
And I hope the reaction won't be eventually you lost weight. It'll be there's something different about you. You have been set apart. You, you have been chosen. You are a representative. And man, your life isn't, it isn't perfect. But even in the adversity you face, you are representing something greater. But here's what I've discovered. Um, as a parent, I stink. As a husband, I stink. As, uh, as a boss, I stink. There are times my attitudes just stink. My impulses are wrong. My longings are flawed. And here's what I've learned, and I really believe this. I wasn't meant to do any of these things by myself. That the Holy Spirit has always been available to fill me for the moment. To take this form that God has been refining through adversity and trials and challenges. Uh, those are chisel marks, by the way. Th those are the form, uh, the, the means by which God is forming you into what he longs you to ultimately be. And I want to just take a deep breath and pause and say, I know for some of you right now that's really uncomfortable. It really hurts. And I'm sorry. Um, that's why I love that Peter says, dear friends, like empathetically understands that the location isn't desirable. But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is aiding all of those circumstances, and he won't let the chisel go any further than he has already planned for it to go. That he is shaping you for a purpose, so that at some point there is meaning to the trials you have gone through. I believe with all of my heart that Holy Spirit has chosen you, is setting you apart, is filling you for his purpose. Um, one of the, the challenges, though, is um, we're always being formed by something. And sometimes the, the forming agents are more attractive than the chisel. Uh, I, I think for a moment, I, I go back to um, Moses. You know, Moses is um, an awesome character, and, and Jeremy was talking to me Wednesday night about Moses, and I've been thinking about Moses ever since. Um, you know, Moses is just this real interesting character. God chose him. When all the other little boys are being murdered, there's no other way to put it by the Egyptian rule out of fear, Moses is spared and chosen. He is pulled from the water, and he becomes a child of Pharaoh of Egypt. And for years, he functions in this form. But there is a discontent in Moses for a long time. God, really? These are my people. I don't know how he learns that. I don't know if he looks in a... a foggy mirror-like thing one day and says, I don't look like them. I look different. I don't know if he felt different, because I know sometimes we feel different. But he realized one day he was different. And he, he longed for, like some of us, for justice. He longed for what needed to happen to happen, for the Hebrew people to be treated with fairness and equity and love. But that wasn't happening. And just like in our time, in our world, and just like we do, and just like we see in the culture around us, sometimes people long for the right thing to happen, but go about it in all the wrong ways. I don't know if you've ever done that. I've done that. I've wanted the right thing to happen, but I've gone about it the wrong way. Fair, uh, excuse me, Moses sees his people being mistreated, and he murders a man. His desire, I believe, was justice. Just like sometimes our desire is justice, but when we go about it the wrong way, we take it into our own hands, um, that doesn't accomplish God's purpose for God to be glorified. God didn't need Moses to murder somebody, but God redeemed that moment. It took 40 years. Just let that sink in for a minute. 
sometimes it takes much longer to get where we need to be than we think it should. But Moses runs, just like we so often run from what we're really experiencing. From We run from God's presence. We run from the circumstances going on. We hope that doing something else or going some other place or filling our life with some other activity with maybe a family like Moses did, uh, maybe with a new occupation, maybe with some wealth and, 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 and just a whole new world, it didn't do it. Ultimately, it didn't do it for Moses in one day. Like Pentecost, a fire shows up in a bush. A bush that, if it caught on fire, should have just burned up. But it didn't. And so he had to draw closer to it. There's something different about this bush. There's something different here. And so he draws close and he realizes this is different. This is holy ground. Like this. This is holy ground. A space where God can speak to you, and I tell you what, um, Moses entered into a conversation, into a relationship with God that quite frankly reformed his entire existence. It pulled him out of a new comfort zone. It reminded him of past failures. It took him through the trails of where he'd already walked. But this time, he was going to do it by God's power. Now, I'm going to fast forward really fast, and I tell you, you know these ten plagues, this powerful story, miracles of God. But then Moses, by the power of God, the presence of God's Spirit, um, he brings Egypt to its knees. And Pharaoh lets these people go. And they are led by a pillar of fire i mean it seems evident look at what god's doing and sometimes we're led by pillars of fire and it's it's just like oh man god has called me to transformation my why is freedom is right in front of me and i want that can i remind you however that pillar of fire led them to a mountain and on that mountain god descended And on that mountain, God's presence was just powerful and palpable and frightening. And as Moses went to meet with God, people's hearts were tugged away from the powerful presence right in front of them. Sometimes God's right in front of us, friends. And um, the reality is we don't think it's enough. We'd rather something that could be right here. And so they took fire, and they misused it. They melted down jewelry and made a golden calf, an idol. A God that reminded them of themselves and where they'd been. A God that was tangible and safer Sometimes we do that. We make relationships idols. We, we make substances idols. We make um, travel and trips and status an idol. And um, we melt things down that should be holy things. And we just turn them into us things. Fire can be misrepresented, and I think the church has misrepresented fire many, many times. Uh, we, we have made our holiness, which is consuming fire, the presence of the Holy Spirit, into just behavioralism. And l- let me tell you, um, verse 11, they, there's not a lot to argue about. Peter says this, Dear friends, you have these desires. You have these desires longings abstain from them because if our overall function is to glorify god then being set apart is taking these living stones us that god is chiseling away out and it is to set them apart for a holy purpose they're not to be used like the rest 
of the stones are used. But instead, we're being built into something. And what that means is um, we can't contaminate the holy with the unholy. So there are things, as Paul will later write, and he will say, you know, these things aren't wrong. But I tell you what, they aren't beneficial to you either. And here's, here's the judgment. Does this bring glory to God? Does this represent God well? Does this put God in a light that says, wow, there's something different about these people? Not for behavioralism's sake, but because we are called to represent God in our current location by how we live. It's our call to holiness. Uh, the, The function of our life, of the church, is to bring glory to God. Uh, Can I get really practical? Your circumstances are given to you to bring glory to God in the midst of what you're going through. You know, if our life is just peachy and perfect, then wow. um, Well, let let me just speak really frankly. Here's how we act. I'm praying for God to bless me. And you know what we're saying? God, I want my circumstances to be just wonderful so that when everybody looks at me, they say, wow, man, serving God is awesome. Look at the car, look at the house, look at the person, look at the stuff. That's never what God was looking for. I think it's kind of flipped over. It's, God, I'm in this mess. May the decisions I make, may the life I lead, may it bless you. May it bring glory to you so that the world will know. That's hard stuff. So here's the question. Um, Let's get practical. Um, I have a picture. Can we throw up the picture of the the tools? Uh, On this site, um, James Parker Sculpture, where I found him making this awesome little structure out of stone, uh, a picture right near it were, were these tools. And I don't know, it captured me. It captured my mind. It captured my heart. Um, Because as I look at it, I'm like, you know what? I need tools. If I'm going to be formed and shaped, um, reformed, because the truth is there there are parts in my life that have already been formed by things. They need to be reformed. Um, There needs to be some tools. And some of these tools look really dangerous. Uh, really, I mean, they look, they look scary. And I'm reminded that being formed um, isn't always comfortable. But bottom line, we need tools. If I'm going to experience the presence of Holy Spirit on an ongoing manner, then I need tools. I can't just wish it. I can't just want it. I have to pursue it. I have to long for it. I have to count Jesus, as we looked in the last section, as precious. And I have to build my life on that, which means I have to become active in chiseling and hammering and shaping and building my life to fit into the function and the form that God longs for it to be. So what are those tools? I don't have slides. I'm I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to spout for a moment. You okay with that? I ha- Thank you. I've been, um, just personally, I'll say it like this. I've been following Jesus a really long time. And I have just found, on a personal level, that if I'm not taking seriously the Word of God, I'm missing out on what, one of God's greatest tools for reforming my life. Now, I, here's the problem I know. I know some of you are like, yeah, but I, you're educated in the Bible. And uh, let me tell you, I didn't start educated in the Bible. I started out really dumb in the Bible. Uh, I mean, all I knew to do was flop it open and point. And God used that. And I'll tell you what, over the years, I, I, I misinterpreted lots of things. 
I mean, like, I, I just, I totally messed it up. I'm like, I read it wrong. I believed it wrong. And here's what I know. God still used that to change my life. And over the years and years and years of reading it uh, and starting to understand it more, it started changing me. But not just the way I behave. Some of you know I don't always behave right. But it started changing the way I think. The way I process my location, my problems, my relationships. It's helping me not to look at people or my spouse or my kids as a way to glorify my own life, to get what I want, but instead to form me, shape me into a servant, to make me more in the image of Jesus. Scripture is one of these things that I tell you, um, we know. I, I would suggest probably almost everybody in here really values it. And probably the ongoing relationship we have with it is, yeah, I know it's important, but I'm really busy. I don't like to read. I don't like to, um, I, like, I'm not a morning person, but then at night I sit down to do it, and, I mean, I just get distracted because, I mean, Instagram is exciting. It's really fun. And now I'm too tired. I just can't, I can't do it. Can I just suggest to you, with the dear friends of Peter, Scripture is a double-edged tool that has a way to go in and to pinpoint what needs to transform in our life. And guided by the Holy Spirit, it can begin to reform us. We're trying to do some things around here to make it more accessible. I don't know if you are on our social, um, but Instagram, Facebook, we, we post daily just readings from the, the YouVersion Bible. We aren't brilliant. We don't make this stuff up. We know how to copy and paste. But it's a way to say, I want to make it accessible to you. We want you to be in God's Word. And it follows a theme, I try to tell you. YouVersion is just an awesome free app on your phone. You can download it, and it has Bible reading plans. If you don't know where to start, just pick any one of them. The great news is that you can search for what you're going through. My relationship stinks. You can probably type that in, and I bet you a plan will come up. <laughs> Finances, anxiety, stress, it'll come up. Uh, we try to share a reading plan every single week. So I just want to suggest to you, would you get into God's Word? Second thing is this, and, and, and these two, for me, are hand in glove. Prayer. Uh, prayer is an awfully spiritual word, and most of us think, I don't pray well. Why would God want to listen to me anyway? Um, can I just suggest, it's not about the quality. It's like having the right words. Like, I grew up and people spoke and prayed these awesome prayers, and they they had this inflection with their voice, and they prayed this certain way. And I grew up feeling like, I can't do that. But the funny thing is, is I learned to do that. And then I realized how fake I was. I was praying somebody else's prayer. And then I started realizing, God wants to speak to me, and I want to speak to God. What if I just looked at every decision I was going through as an opportunity to pray, and maybe God would meet me in that? Like going to the grocery store and, and uh, hey, God, should I buy the cornflakes or the Fruit Loops? You're, you laugh. You're like, that's, that's really silly. It is silly. But to frame our minds, to form our minds in such a way to think God would be interested in something so trivial. That is a reforming way of thinking. God, um, I really, I, man, I'm really ticked off in this relationship right now. This person is not fulfilling my needs. Um, you know, we, let's be honest, we're friends. We live there, right? 
prayer is a way of me starting to say, God, I'm not fulfilled in this. God, I want you to fix this. God, I want you to fix them. And then I think as we're doing that, God will start saying, I'm happy to do that. Let's start with you. And I think God will begin to reveal to you. Um, there, the fun word, right? There's a fun word, and this is the last part of the application of Scripture and prayer. Um, abstain from. Abstain from sinful desires. I really want to chew my spouse out because they're not meeting my needs right now. God, that desire, that thought is sinful. I abstain from it in Jesus' name. I hate my employer. They're so unfair. Um, Peter's writing to a whole country of aliens, exiles, and strangers who are, we're going to learn next week, slaves. And he says to them, um, abstain from sinful desires and obey your slave master. Ooh. Because the way you act, the way you live, brings glory to God or doesn't. Um, so, God, in my act of prayer, I'm asking you, help me to abstain from these evil desires. God, I really want some satisfaction right now. I really want to, to escape from all the pressure and tension I feel right now. Um, prayer. God, help me to abstain from sinful desires. All I want to do is ignore what I'm feeling by scrolling. Help me to stop scrolling. I want my marriage to be better. Put the phone away. Abstain from it. I, I want my marriage to be better, and we seem to fight about money all the time. Abstain from spending money. Delete Amazon from your phone. I know these seem so, like, trivial, so, like, on the nose, right? But... The reality is these decisions we make are, are opportunities to pray every moment. And here's what I believe. Scripture gives you wisdom for each one of those scenarios. And so today, here we are, um, disenfranchised people having to look at both the form of our life and the function of our life. And I think all too often our function is, I want to serve me. This life is about me. This life is about what I want. And, and boy, Peter just hits it. Repent. Turn to Jesus. Be filled by the Holy Spirit. You can't do it, but Holy Spirit can help you do what you've never been able to do. What does it take? Instead of self-indulgence, surrender. Surrender. Instead of entertainment, worship. Instead of indulgence, sacrifice. All forms of saying, I have been chosen. I have been set apart to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And these are God's way of tap, 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 chiseling me down. To fit into what he's made me to be, to represent him. And I tell you what, in a world where relationships aren't valued, marriages aren't valued, where, where um, community is not valued, um, a group of people who surrender their own wants, needs, and desires for the greater good of all humanity to glorify God, that is a people who are set apart. And I tell you what, people are going to look and say, they're different. Did they lose weight? they get some sun? Are they a little bit more tan than they were? No, it's the Holy Spirit fire. It, it has a way of changing one's complexion, behavior, attitudes, desires. And it starts with a bit of surrender. So here's what I want to invite you to do. I want you to bow your heads right now. The worship team is going to come. And uh, I don't know, we just need to take a few moments to 
to do some business because I, I just know with all my heart, Holy Spirit is just like, he is chipping away today. He's picking up some stones and he's placing them. He's, he is splitting some things in half. And the question is, am I ready to trade in self-sufficiency for surrender? My will for obedience. We just want to give you a moment to respond. Holy Spirit, living, present, active. We ask you to give us courage where we are cowardice. Would you like a burning bush just right now stand in front of us and speak? Like tongues of fire, would you come down? Would you help us to address our sinful desires and the things that we need to abstain from so that we can be reformed into your image, to your representatives? And that our function to glorify you would change our very purpose for existing. We ask this in Jesus' name.
find me Cause I'll be dwelling in the house of God Surely His goodness mercy will follow after me So fear will not find me Cause I'll be dwelling in the house of God Surely Your goodness mercy will follow That's what it is to be built into the house of God. So today, I just want to say this. I'm going to close with a short prayer, but um, you shouldn't have to feel alone. If you need somebody to pray with you, um, you could probably grab just about anybody, but I'm going to be up here for a few moments. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, we'll be available up here. For right now, um, as we go, I want to remind you of just two things. One, how valuable you are to God, how much he loves you. And number two, that we have a sign-up sheet for Vacation Bible School on the way out. And um, if you want to sign up to help, we would greatly appreciate it. Would you pray with me? God, as we close up this service, um, I don't want to in any way put all the pressure on us as individuals. Lord, I am reminded that that's why you sent Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And so right now, Holy Spirit, we invite you in individually and collectively. Holy Spirit, we ask you to give us supernatural power that is unable to achieve on one's own. I pray that you would empower the Word of God, that you would empower our prayer, and that you would empower us to say no when everything in us wants to say yes. All of that so that we may in the end glorify you and that both the form and the function of our lives would bring glory to you. So God, as we go from here, help us to represent you well, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.